Dankeschön. Okay. From today, but from Saturday. Ah, why are not here? Okay, I will check this. Why are not here? But you, you should be I think it's green. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's just start the next session with uh, Gerhard talk on uh, <coughs> superconducting qubit quantum computation. Okay, um, so yesterday we ended up uh, that if we have our Hamiltonian and we go into dispersive regime, which means uh, qubit are, and cavity are not on resonance but detuned from each other, uh, that we now get this, uh, this effective Hamiltonian here. Uh, which allows us um, to read out the cavity, uh, to read out the qubit, qubit by probing the cavity. So we just shine in a tone here. Uh, if the qubit is in a ground state, the cavity resonance is sort of this blue Lorentzian shaped line, and we get, will get a lot of transmitted signal. Whereas if the qubit is in the excited state, my cavity uh, peak will have shifted over due to this dispersive interaction, and now I will find very low transmission. And we have seen that we can use that in experiments uh, to really um, uh, do a, a single shot detection of our qubit so we can really sort of see quantum jumps um, um, if we can use these newly developed quantum limited amplifiers. Uh, and I've also shown you what happens without those amplifiers in such a single trace, nothing much is left, so you could only uh, measure expectation, expectation values. So you could still do a lot of averages and then uh, still uh, get the value out for the qubit state, but only an expectation value. Uh, now, this, this dispersive Hamiltonian also has sort of a flip side. Um, um, uh, in, in some sense, people like to call this a, w, uh, a doubly Q and D interaction. So now I've, this is again the same Hamiltonian, but now I've just taken this term here and combined it with the qubit part. So now all of a sudden what happens is that the qubit transition frequency depends on the number of photons in the cavity. Um, so again, this, this chi is this dispersive shift. And we can actually, for example, do experiments where we put the coherent state in the cavity. So in this case, it, it was um, you know, about one photon. Um, and uh, if we would have an empty cavity, we would only see a qubit excitation peak right here. So I just excite the qubit and, and read it out by the cavity and see when I can excite it. Uh, I would only find a single peak if there's no photon in the cavity. But if I put photons in the cavity, uh, while, and they stay there while I do my spectroscopy, I can actually see these multiple peaks here. And uh, the distance here, in this case, is really sort of uh, exactly uh, this chi, how I've written it there. So this means um, I can really sort of use my qubit to, for example, detect the number of photons in my resonator. So I can ask the question, are there or is there one photon in the cavity uh, uh, by just, for example, applying a pulse on my qubit exactly at that frequency. And if I make this pulse wide enough, uh, then the Fourier transform is, of this pulse is narrow enough that it only talks to this one resonance peak and flips the qubit if and only if there's one photon in the cavity. Um, so I can really do sort of a conditional gate operation on my qubit state conditioned on the cavity state. Um, uh, this, I unfortunately wanted to 
spend some more time talking about applications of these four quantum optics experiments, it turns out if I have this capability, I can quite easily create Schrodinger cat states in a resonator. I can do state tomography of those um, uh, states. Uh, I can do operations on them and so forth. Um, so, but what I sort of, um, but unfortunately I won't have the time, but you can find sort of at the end of the slides I uploaded, you can find sort of a, a summary of that, uh, how you can do quantum optics using, um, using these techniques. Um, what I actually wanted to talk a little bit about um, is some experimental techniques. So, um, um, what do we use in the lab? Um, um, to really control these type of superconducting circuits. Um, let's start out first, what are the types of superconductors uh, we actually use? Um, so typically I would say in the community we use these three. We use aluminum whenever we want to make junctions. Um, so aluminum is a type one superconductor which is with a transition frequency of about the Kelvin. Um, aluminum has the advantage it forms a perfect um, um, if I oxidize it, it uh, forms a perfect insulator, very close to sapphire. I mean, it's, it's, it's amorphous aluminum oxide, but it forms a perfect barrier for a Josephson junction. So this is sort of the best barrier we know how to do this very thin insulating barrier between the two superconducting halves. And so with that, it's very easy to actually create a junction. I'll, I'll tell you in a little bit, we use this uh, shadow evaporation technique to actually create junctions. So aluminum is typically used for qubits and junctions. Uh, niobium is actually quite nice because it has a somewhat higher transition temperature. Um, it's typically used for coplanar waveguide resonators. Um, uh, it's not so ideal for junctions because it's much harder to actually do shadow evaporation with it. Typically, one, uh, one can only etch niobium very well. Um, a new material which has come up in the last couple of years is, well, it's not a new material, but a, a material that hasn't been used so far up until very recently is niobium titanium nitride. It's also a type two superconductor with an even higher transition temperature. And it turns out uh, that this seems to be a very good material to uh, make, for example, capacitors for qubits and so on, because it seems it has uh, the uh, better surface uh, or interface quality, I should say, than, for example, niobium or aluminum. So people use this for resonators and qubits, and I've seen uh, very, very great success. Um, now, all of those materials have to be put on something. Uh, uh, so some form of substrate I construct my structure on, and typically the people uh, use silicon or sapphire because those are the two materials which have the lowest loss tangent in microwaves. So they, are, they don't have a lot of dissipation at microwave frequencies, uh, so that's why uh, people <coughs> either choose sapphire or silicon. Sapphire is even slightly better than, than silicon. Uh, with silicon, it's always a little hard to control the exact doping and so on, so uh, this makes it a little harder. Uh, so it really sort of, these substrates here, if they are not perfect, they will contribute to losses and so on we have in the qubits. Now how do we create all of the structures I've shown you? I've shown you a couple pictures of resonators, qubits, and so on. Uh, what we have to do is essentially do lithography. Uh, so we, um, I'll explain you that in a little bit more graphically. Essentially what we can use is um, we, we uh, put um, uh, sort of photoresists or e-beam resists on top of that sapphire and we can then write a mask using optical lithography or e-beam lithography so we can define those very narrow structures uh, so with that mask, we can then do uh, the uh, thin film deposition of the materials. So uh, there's different, different ways of doing that. You can use an electron beam to heat up your metal. It evaporates and uh, gets put down. Uh, you can have different sputtering techniques. Uh, and all of that creates the thin films we then use. Um, and then uh, there's two ways of then actually getting the structures. You can then you can either, for example, etch away all the stuff you don't want. Uh, so this is if you sort of, the mask you wrote is sort of the negative pattern. You sort of remove everything you don't like and keep the stuff you want. And the positive pattern you would do for liftoff. So exactly where you have your holes in the mask, 
um, and that's where the material would go down and you deposit it only on the, on the um, substrate where you want it. So let's maybe see in a little bit more, more graphically how we actually do that. So, um, okay, so what you see here is sort of the side view of uh, an aluminum, uh, uh, sorry, uh, a sapphire wafer, so something typically like 300 micron thick, so obviously this picture is not to scale. Um, then on top of that, we, we put the so-called e-beam resist. So this is a polymer which reacts to uh, electrons. Um, so of about 600 nanometers here and another layer of a different polymer of about 100 nanometers. And sort of this is the same um, chip from the top with those two layers. So all we see is this gray top layer. What we then do is we take an electron beam uh, and we put um, uh, electrons on places wherever we want to sort of change uh, the chemical structure of this resist. And depending on the dose, we can only um, change, for example, the lower one, or we can change both of them. Because this guy will change its sort of chemical structure at a much higher dose than the other one. So what we, what we then get, uh, and we can then sort of uh, take for example, isopropanol and water to sort of wash away this whole, uh, everything we have developed, everything ha we have hit with this electron beam, and what we then get is a mask which looks something like this from the top. So here, this part here would be that bridge you can see here, and that part, I should have maybe drawn in blue, really goes sort of down onto the sapphire. So this is really sort of everything here that's now open, um, and this is the bridge, so this would be a cut right through here, through the center. So what we can then do is we can evaporate aluminum under an angle, um, and what will happen is that that bridge that's standing here and these edges will actually throw a shadow. So what will be deposited on the chip will be something like a thin film here, right in that gap. Uh, then we get the shadow from this bridge, which forms an opening there, and then we get another thin film here on the back. And so there's also the, the shadow coming from this, this backside here. Um, so uh, what you can then do, say we want to build a Josephson junction, what we have to get is this very thin uh, insulating barrier. And for aluminum, I already said this is very easy to do. All I have uh, to actually do in my chamber is I have to put oxygen in. And then what I will get is over time, uh, uh, almost self-limiting uh, aluminum oxide film grows. Uh, if I do it right, it will be about a nanometer thick. Now everything is actually covered in a very thin layer of, all the aluminum is covered in a thin layer of aluminum oxide. And now with the second aluminum evaporation step, I've actually created my Josephson junction. Because now that shadow from this bridge I have here actually is, is uh, goes into the other direction. So now my top aluminum film extends all the way sort of over here and up there, and right in this area is where I formed the junction, because now Cooper pairs have to come in in this green layer, go all the way till here, and then they have to tunnel through the barrier and continue on in the blue film. Um, so with that, I'm almost done. Uh, what's left is I want to sort of wash away all the rest of the mask, so this remaining PMMA and MMA layer, all the bridge and everything. Uh, I do that using acetone, and what I've left then is just these thin films of aluminum with this barrier in between, and sort of right here, this is where I've created my junction. So. Um, here's an electron beam image of an actual junction, and you can see it's sort of a very similar structure. Um, so here, down there, this is the bottom layer which has been oxidized. Uh, you can sort of see it here. And then on top is the green layer, uh, and the junction is right there. So with this technique, uh, we can create junctions which are a few hundred, hundred nanometers in size. So here you have a scale bar, so this distance here is like uh, 500 nanometers, so this is like 100 to 200 nanometers. You can make them even slightly smaller if you want to. Uh, using 
these tricks or similar tricks, so this is called the Dolan Bridge Shadow Technique to create a junction, you can create much more complex structures. So you don't need to do a single junction, you can do, in this case, like a thousand. Uh, you can put them, you can see in arbitrary shapes, you can make them in different sizes. Um, you can integrate them with a resonator like has been done here. So with that, you have really a full design flexibility and can really sort of tailor uh, the, the circuits to your liking. Okay, so now, so that means uh, we know how to create such circuits, uh, circuits at least in principle. Um, what else do we need in terms of experimental apparatus to actually control them? Well, typically an experiment looks something like that uh, from, the, from the control side. So you have a computer nowadays typically running some, some a Python program that controls all the experiments in uh, all the um, uh, instruments in the lab. Uh, so you have some here, some um, fast uh, analog to digital converters and digital to analog converters that on one hand create signals uh, uh, in the few hundred megahertz range. Um, so so this, this guy here is a digital to analog converter or also called arbitrary waveform generator. It creates signals somewhere between 50 to 200 megahertz. Um, and this is then put into a mixer and up converted into the few gigahertz range. So with that device, you then have full amplitude and phase control over the pulses you do. All of that is then sent down in a fridge, maybe combined with additional signals. Uh, and then signals come out. Um, and now we have to somehow measure these few uh, gigahertz signals. We want to digitize them. So the best way to do that is actually, again, mix them down. Uh, from this couple gigahertz to something like 10, 20, 30 megahertz, which you can then easily digitize using uh, an analog to digital converter, which samples with, uh, say, for example, a nanosecond or something like that, and that transfers the data to the, to the uh, PC where you can post-process them and so forth. Uh, there's also additional um, um, experiments, uh, sorry, instruments like this vector network analyzer, which allows us to do frequency sweeps. So, for example, measure the spectrum, the transmission spectrum of a resonator very efficiently. Um, now, sort of a big part, of course, which is missing in, in this picture here is the fridge. Uh, so, the inside of one of our dilution fridges usually uh, typically looks like that. Uh, so what is not shown here is that normally you have sort of heat and vacuum shields around sort of uh, out sort of here you have typically a cylinder with a vacuum uh, can around and then it's sort of like those, those Russian matryoshka dolls that sort of nest into each other. You have sort of one heat shield, one cylinder after another normally attached to all of those plates. So up there, this first thing here, this is really room temperature. Um, then you go down to something like 50 Kelvin on that plate and with an attached cylinder. Uh, then you have 4K with a cylinder and then you're down to 1K, uh, 100 millikelvin until you really reach our sample area where we have about 20 millikelvin temperature. Um, and so we have this whole bottom plate we can actually uh, bolt our samples to. And sort of nowadays, fridges, this, this base plate to give you a dimension is about, about that size. So we have actually quite a bit of room to put all of our stuff there. Um, so the actual um, sort of core of this whole cryostat is this dilution unit here. Uh, so what actually happens is uh, one circulates a mixture of helium-4 and helium-3 in uh, sort of these pipes. Uh, so you have a couple of heat exchangers uh, where sort of the gas that goes out uh, pre-cools the gas that is coming in. And at the end, what happens is you have sort of down here, you have liquid helium-4 with uh, helium-3 on top and sort of a little bit of the helium-3 is actually inside uh, the helium-4. And what you do is you sort of, um, uh, you, on, on one side, you sort of re-inject the helium-3, and on the other side, you suck on it with a turbo pump. And what you effectively do then is what more or less everybody does when he eats a hot soup or drinks a coffee. If it's too hot, what do you do? Say again? 
you, know, you blow on it. You essentially blow the hot particles away. And the same trick we use here. With the turbo pump, we suck on this helium-4 with a little bit helium-3 inside, and the helium-3 comes out um, and sort of uh, takes away the heat. Um, um, and with that, we can actually cool this whole thing down to 20 millikelvin. Now, this really is a commercial product you can really buy. Um, if you... Oh, those are, those are gold-plated. Uh, uh, this is more, um, not because gold has, a, so these are copper plates, which are gold-plated. The gold plating is not there because it has higher heat conductivity. Uh, it's there because the copper would oxidize over time, and this, this layer is actually very, a very efficient insulation layer. So whatever I would bolt there wouldn't ha be thermally connected very well to, to the plate. So, and if you make that in gold, then it doesn't oxidize, so you can always make good connections. Um, so, um, you should, uh, if you want to know, uh, so, so to properly explain the, the cryos, that would take a little longer, um, but sort of takeaways, it's essentially a little bit like evaporative cooling. Uh, there's a very, very nice and really well explained um, YouTube video by Andrea Morello. Uh, you, sh you should check it out if you want to know uh, a little more how this cryos that works. Um, so what else is inside? Um, so here you can see, uh, so this was the cryos that pretty much empty, nothing inside, and then you see there's sort of a whole bunch of things that, uh, that came in. So you sort of see again, now we have a lot of stuff here on the bottom, and also here all of that part seems to have gotten busier. So what happened is, um, we have put in a bunch of microwave cables. So here you can sort of see these gray lines, I hope. Um, so those are coax cables made out of stainless steel to uh, transfer microwave signals down. We make them out of stainless steel because we don't want to, you know, if, you, if I would take copper, I would short out this top plate and this plate just because of the high uh, thermal conductivity of the copper. If I use stainless steel, the heat load on that plate is reduced and I can actually cool down my fridge. Um, then, for example, here we have, this is on top of this four calorie plate, we have uh, very low noise amplifiers. We actually need to amplify our microwave signals up uh, that we can read out our qubits. Um, what we also have here in these lines, uh, we actually have attenuators which attenuate our incoming signal. But they not only attenuate the incoming signal, but also the incoming noise. Because you have to think about sort of my environment is up here at 300 Kelvin, and it radiates noise with a 300 Kelvin temperature, and it would come down this coax cable and straight away go into my device, which sits at 20 millikelvin. So that has to be bad. I mean, there's noise coming in pretty much at 300 Kelvin. So what I do is I effectively attenuate it by six orders of magnitude to get the effective noise temperature down to also something like, uh, well, below 20 millikelvin effectively, uh, which means that there's not, no excess noise coming sort of down these lines, which would excite my qubit uh, unintentionally, for example. Um, then down here, that's, yes? Say again? It's relatively rigid. Um, um, so you can see here uh, up, uh, so these are actually stainless steel rods uh, that are bolted top and bottom. I mean, it's not, so if you, if you try and push it, it gives a little, but not a lot. So it, uh, say again? No, 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 they're not. Um, in, in sort of more recent fridges, uh, they actually use some, uh, I don't know exactly, some, some carbon fiber organic compounds to make those connections, which uh, has some advantages. It's more rigid, has less heat conductivity, is as stable, and so on. Uh, but in, in principle, it's, 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 a, it's a rigid structure. Yeah. Oh, um, actually, it actually contracts quite a bit, if you calculate it. Uh, and that's, it's a little hard to see. That's the reason why our coax cables have these bends. They are not straight because that would put too much stress on them and actually make them bad. But if you put those bends in, uh, those are a little bigger than necessary. You can get away with just a small wiggle, sort of. But if you have that on every stage, that sort of can eat up the compression of the fridge, and then the cable even works when the whole fridge got 
uh, I think it's a couple millimeters actually shorter. Um, okay, um, now, right, down here we have the sample area, so, um, so in, in our case we sort of, we are working with sort of uh, 3D cavities and waveguides, so rather big things. Um, so this is actually sort of a, a waveguide uh, cavity where the qubits live inside. You can sort of see here the cables coming out. Then those uh, here are so-called mu metal cans, uh, which are effectively a magnetic shield. So this is a material with a very, very high mu R, um, um, uh, which sort of uh, ensures that we have a, a very low magnetic field inside that can. Uh, then sort of all of those cables come out. Uh, normally there's even another copper can around this whole thing. Um, so well here you can sort of see the mu metal uh, shield sort of uh, assembled. So there's a second half which slides on top. Um, um, yeah, one more thing we actually need uh, are those isolators up top here. Um, um, maybe some of you know uh, uh, optical diodes, and these isolators are the same thing just for microwaves. Essentially, they are a one-way street for microwave signals. So our measurement signals sort of go in the fridge via these heavily attenuated lines, but then they go out through those isolators through superconducting cables because we don't want to lose any of this measurement signal and then go to those um, low noise amplifiers. Uh, but the problem is those low noise amplifiers actually are, have some noise that actually comes back out and I don't want to have that go back into my qubit. So we use those isolators to sort of isolate uh, so it, and sort of the, the signal that comes back from, the, from these, these amplifiers is not allowed to actually propagate through the isolator as it's just a one way street out. Um, so. Here you could, for example, see a typical wiring diagram where I've now sort of pretty much explained most of the components. So you see typically we have like multiple um, lines actually going in. So that would be the input side with attenuators, additional microwave filtering and so on. Uh, and then sort of signals can come out. They go through those circulators or isolators, additional filtering and so on up into those high electron mobility transistor amplifiers, those very low noise amplifiers I've shown you. Um, uh, in principle, we can also then, in addition, have these quantum limited amplifiers, so sort of signals would come out, go into that amplifier, bounce back off, and then sort of come out that line. Uh, so these circulators are actually sort of, I come in that port, it routes me through here, then that second circulator routes me to there, and if I come back, I don't go back that way, but sort of go around and then out. So they allow me sort of to use these quantum limited amplifiers, which sort of only work in reflection very well. Um, so you see sort of there's, there's uh, you know, quite a bit of, for a sort of state-of-the-art experiment, you need quite some cables going in and out of the fridge. Um, okay, so unless there are some questions, to that part, um, how am I doing with time? That's 20 minutes or something? Yeah. Okay, good, perfect. Uh, you mean these ones? Well, um, yeah, I can't go in from the side, or, or typically this is not done because then I have to go, I mean, as I've said, there's like multiple shields around here, so cylinders attached normally to all of those plates, so I would have to go through those, and that would be a very short segment of line, so I would have, just because it's so short, a lot of heat transport across this very short, short section. So now this is deliberately made long, that I have a long section of stainless steel, that the effective heat transport across is not sort of the heat input on the next stage, I should actually say downward, is not too high. So I need, I need a certain length of, of cable to ensure that I don't have you know, too much heat transport. Um, okay, so. Um, Let's talk a little bit about quantum information processing with uh, circuit uh, QED. Um, and essentially, I'll just show you uh, how we can uh, create uh, entangled states uh, using such a device. We've already talked about how to do signal qubit operations. Essentially, I just shine in a microwave signal um, that allows me to do uh, X and Y rotations. 
Uh, what's been missing is how do we do actually two qubit operations? So let me show you a couple of uh, nice examples of, of chips uh, that have been used to create entangled states. So this is a, a four qubit chip out of Yale, where here in the middle, this meandering line, that's actually a coplanar waveguide resonator. Um, and then you have one, two, three, four qubits, just like that. So you see sort of this is, again, a transmon, a capacitance here, a, capa a sort of one plate of the capacitor here, one plate there. That's where the junctions sit. Again, this is a squid, so this guy is frequency tunable. Uh, and that couples to this coplanar waveguide resonator, so this lambda half uh, resonator down here. So in this case, uh, this is sort of a, quite a while back, like uh, seven years or so. Um, coherence times weren't as great. Uh, for the, we, there were only three qubits were used, uh, and coherence times were something like a few microseconds or like a microsecond or so. Um, and while well, each of those qubits has this additional line coming in where I can send current in to create a magnetic field, which allows me to change the frequency, to change the flux through the squid loop and thus the frequency of the qubit. Um, this is a little more recent design from Leo Di Carlo's group in Delft. Um, in this case, they actually have five qubits. Uh, so you can again see sort of these structures here, which is the capacitor. You can't really see the junction area. And you can see multiple resonators in this case. So each qubit has actually its individual readout resonator. So that guy here reads out that qubit, um, that guy here that qubit. Uh, then I uh, have to think, so that guy this one, that guy that one. And then in addition, we have these long resonators which actually connect multiple qubits. So I have one which connects that guy, that guy, and that guy, and another one which connects this one, that one, and that one. Um, and um, what... Uh, one can actually do with these resonators is actually mediate interactions between the qubits. So very similar to what you've heard for a trapped ion system, where I use my phonon bus to mediate interactions between one ion and another one, I can here use a photonic bus, the resonator, to mediate interactions uh, between that qubit and that one or that one. Um, all of those qubits are, again, flux tunable. Um, and I can, um, um, yeah, uh, change their frequency as I want it. Um, um, so, because I, in both of those cases, you've seen that multiple qubits are actually coupled to the same resonator. So if I want to draw some form of circuit, what I get is something like that. One qubit capacitively coupled to a resonator with some resonance frequency, again, coupled capacitively to another resonator. So uh, if you sort of then uh, work this out, uh, it actually turns out what I get is an interaction Hamiltonian between those two qubits, uh, which is of the form sigma plus, sigma minus. So I again get this exchange of interactions, but this time it's mediated via the resonator. The resonator, though, is not on resonance with the qubit, but it sits off resonantly. So now, how far this guy is detuned and how well this qubit and that qubit coupled to the resonator all goes into this effective coupling strength. Uh, but in essence, sort of, if those, those two qubits can exchange excitations without the excitation ever living really inside this resonator, because they are so far detuned. Um, another slightly different chip uh, is uh, by the Martinez group uh, or Google, uh, meanwhile, uh, where they, for example, have one, two, three, four, five qubits. Each of those qubits has its own readout resonator, but these guys are not coupled via a bus, via this cavity, but they're actually coupled directly to each other. So you see these crosses, that's the transmon, and sort of here there's two crosses coming really close, so they have some capacitive, some direct capacitive coupling, you can also see it sort of in the circuit diagram down here. So this is one qubit with the junctions and this capacitive coupling to the neighbor. So here, five qubits, sort of each of them is coupled to its nearest neighbor. I have five readout resonators to determine the states. All of them are, are um, 
uh, frequency controllable. And in this case, I don't use the resonator to bring in the signals, the microwave signals for the single qubit operations, but I actually use additional lines that come in and couple very, very weakly uh, to my qubit. So this is sort of possible with this cross-shaped design because sort of I can use each end of the cross to do something different to the qubit. In this case, I get a very similar interaction between two qubits. Um, we have pretty much seen that already for the qubit resonator coupling. The only difference now is that it's not an A dagger sigma minus, but it's a sigma plus sigma minus, because essentially there's these guys I treat really as qubits so they can exchange only one interaction. Um, okay, so now how can we actually use this type of interaction uh, to do gate operations? Well, um, if we take one of those systems, and this is actually data from this very first system I showed you, so those four qubits coupled to one resonator. Um, so I sort of try and excite the qubit, or the, the, the many qubits, and I actually then do readout on the resonator. I'll find the following. So, um, so here, this is actually changing the flux through one of the qubit loops, uh, uh, qubit one, so actually qubit one changes its frequency. So what I do then is I shine in a microwave signal trying to excite uh, qubits, and then whenever I sort of manage to excite a qubit, you sort of see this dark gray response of my resonator readout. So initially, sort of all of those three qubits are at different frequencies, so qubit one is at around six gigahertz, two is about seven, three is about eight. And now as I change the flux through qubit one, I can sort of bring it up in frequency, and I bring it in resonance with the qubit one, and right here, because of this interaction, I again have some, some form of avoided crossing, just like we saw in the resonator, um, but this time it's directly between the two qubits, so right here, I have a hybridization between the two qubits, so I can't really speak of qubit one and qubit two anymore, but it's sort of an, a symmetric and anti-symmetric combination of the two. And then if I scan further, I can also bring it in resonance with qubit three, and then even further, I bring it actually in resonance or close to resonance with the cavity. Um, so, um, yeah, one remark on that plot here, this is actually measured with direct cavity transmission, whereas this is really done with spectroscopy, first trying to excite the qubit and then doing a readout. Um, so here, this is really this resonator-mediated uh, qubit-qubit interaction, and it turns out we can actually use this to do a two-qubit gate operation. Now, quick reminder on two-qubit gates. Um, one popular one, um, is, for example, the phase gate, um, which means um, <laughs> if I write down a unitary, uh, you can sort of see that um, there is nothing happening to sort of 0, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 0, but the 1, 1 state gets a minus 1, so a pi phase flip. Uh, now, this phase gate is uh, a universal gate, so I can build a quantum computer with it. So this makes it very appealing, um, um, uh, sort of very similar to a C0 gate. Actually, phase gate and C0 transform into each other. Um, now, a little more general phase gate um, is actually of that form. So here, uh, I have a, I don't do anything to the zero, zero. Uh, zero, one gets a phase change. Uh, one, the one, zero state gets a phase change. But sort of these are trivial, just single qubit phases. What happens to the one one state in this case is that those two phases add up, and what I actually want, and that's the interesting part, I want this additional phase phi one one here, which will actually give me uh, something similar to this minus one. So uh, really I have to find something that allows me to achieve uh, such an additional phase. Um, yeah, those are single qubit phases, and the red one is the, is the two qubit phase. Well, what's a way of doing that? Let's, let's have a look at the time evolution of our states uh, if I have those four. So this is first a very trivial case. So 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1 with their respective energies. So uh, ground state I just give, define as 0. One qubit excited is uh, the energy of that. The other qubit excited is another energy. 
Uh, but the doubly excited state, so one qubit and the other excited, I just add up those energies. So that would be sort of the normal case I would expect. Um, and if I then sort of look at the time evolution of that, um, what I get is uh, nothing happens here. I get some phase there, another phase here, and then just the sum there. So for a given waiting time, the phase evolution uh, for will look something like like this. So this is already so this is sort of very 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 straightforward, uh, and it almost sort of looks like what I've shown you before, with the exception that sort of the most important part is sort of missing. So I want to get something where I have some phases here, but I get this additional phase. So I want something um, that gives me that phi one one. And the easiest way to do that is to somehow manage uh, that the energy of this 1, 1 state does not equal the 1, 0, and 0, 1 state. So I somehow want to push the energy of this 1, 1 state down or up. I want to change it without changing the energy of the 1, 0, and 0, 1 state. And it turns out a good way of doing that is make use of such an avoided crossing. Um, so. Um, what do we do here? So again, this is, uh, I change the frequency of one of the qubits, so this is again a flux uh, through, uh, through this qubit here, so nothing happens to the, to the red qubit, it stays at the same frequency, the same energy. If I change the flux on the other qubit, for example, it comes down in frequency and at some point uh, will meet here and we have an avoided crossing. Now, that turns out wouldn't help us, so what I actually want is I want to somehow get an avoided crossing with that guy up here. Um, so, right, and sort of here, this distance here uh, from whatever um, um, sort of baseline we have, this would give us some phase evolution phi one one, uh, phi zero one, uh, because I just have this detuning and over time I would accumulate some phase. Um, now our phi one zero in this case would be zero uh, because I keep that guy at the same frequency all the time so nothing much would happen. Now how do I actually, uh, what happens actually to this one one state up here is if you remember our qubits are actually not perfect two level systems. And this seems like a bug but actually it's a feature I can now use here uh, to really get what I want. Because if you think about it, I not only have this uh, sort of one qubit excited and the other qubit excited, very close to that has to be a state where uh, one qubit is not excited at all, whereas the qubit I'm changing the frequency of is actually doubly excited. So if it sits in the second excited state. Now, if I uh, change the frequency, if I change the Josephson energy, the slope of that energy level will actually be twice as steep because there's two excitations living up here compared to that one. So this will come in at the steeper angle and at some frequency actually, uh, sorry, at some flux actually meet this one one state and we get this avoided crossing. And now you see that exactly here, this one one state sort of starts to bend down. It's sort of this energy level is not the sum of those two energies anymore. And this is exactly what I wanted to achieve. Um, so, um, I can really sort of now this difference here integrated over time will really give me a phase phi one one because it just you know the energies just don't add up anymore as nicely. So what I can do is uh, sort of here is sort of the three possibilities where my state can start out, and what I do is I sort of change the flux of my qubit, which sort of will bring those states sort of slowly in, and then back out again. So then that guy acquired no phase, that guy acquired this sort of trivial phase, but that guy now got some trivial phase similar to this one, but in addition sort of he, get, he got this phase here I marked in red, so proportional to that area sort of integrated over time. So with that trick we God exactly we can realize if you do all the tuning right, if you pick the speed of that thing in the right way and so on, uh, we can exactly pick up a pi phase shift uh, such that we exactly do uh, this gate operation. 
Um, now, uh, so just changing the flux of one qubit and sort of tuning into this avoided crossing with this doubly excited state allows us to do a phase gate. And with that, it actually turns out it's quite easy uh, to uh, generate entangled states. So for example, this is um, uh, from a paper by the Martinez group, sort of it's a different chip, but using the same gate operation principle. Um, so there's, there's five qubits. So what they started out with is they do uh, a high half pulse on both qubits. So you start in zero, zero, you do two uh, pi half pulses, then you go into a coherent superposition. Uh, then, um, so I can then sort of rewrite this as that state. Uh, then you can actually do your Z gate, which flips the phase of only that state here to a plus. And then you, I can again rewrite this, then it's a little easier to see what the pi pulse, pi over two pulse is to, because here I have a plus x state and this is a minus x state. So this guy will actually rotate with a pi over two pulse around the y axis to zero, whereas that guy will rotate to a one and I've created an entangled state. Then they can actually start concatenating that. Um, I can add another sigma z operation, uh, a phase gate between qubit two and three. You can run through the same sequence. Uh, so I start out at zero, zero plus one, one. I do a pi pulse. Uh, I'll get that state, which is rewritten this one. Uh, only one of them will get a phase flip, which is um, this last one right here. Um, and then I rewrite it again to see what my last pi pulse does, and it brings again this state to a zero and this to a one. Um, and so on. I can do the same then for four qubits. I can do the same for five qubits um, uh, and create all of these entangled states. So what you can actually see here are the density matrices of those states. So um, on the diagonal, you have the population. So here you see 0, 0 is populated and 1, 1 is populated. I have no population 0, 1 and 1, 0. And here, those are actually the coherences uh, in, in the density matrix telling me this is actually a coherent, it's, it, well, it's a coherent superposition of those two states, actually in a tangled state, so it's not just a mixture. Um, I can do the same for three. You see I only have zero, zero and one, one. Nothing here in this diagonal and the coherence is again on the outside. The same for four qubits and the same for five qubits. You see there is some experimental imperfections. If you look closely, there are some error, some bars in here which are not perfectly zero. And you can also see um, they don't go up all the way to one half as they should, but they are a little shy of that. Uh, so in, in Back then, meanwhile, this has actually been improved quite a bit. Uh, back then, they could create this two qubit entangled state with something like 99%, and then it sort of goes down until this five qubit state to something like 80, 82% uh, state fidelity. Okay, um, yeah, so that's actually almost ideal. So with that, I'm actually at the end. So um, using these very similar gate operations, I can actually then think about implementing algorithms um, uh, doing more complicated things, also like quantum simulation, um, um, but in principle, it sort of relies on those tools. Um, okay, so with that, I hope I could give you some idea on, on how to quantize a circuit, how to build a qubit, and combine everything to such a circuit QED uh, system uh, where we can use resonator for readout and controlling the qubit. Um, I showed you a little bit our experimental techniques, and then how we can really use such a platform to create entangled state, and then in the end use it for algorithms. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>